Thank you. Praise God. Amen. Hey, I need somebody. Brother Dave, you get some of these out. Brother Bob, would you mind? Uh, I'm sorry, I should have given these to you a little bit ago. So, and yeah, Brother Harold, whoever will. I, I don't know. I think we've seen more and more that they're not too concerned about the virus being on surfaces. Um, but if you don't want to take one, that's okay. All right. Please know that I got no ill feeling, no ought towards you, no matter how you process what insanity we're going through, okay? You are my brother and sister, and I don't want to do anything to make you feel susceptible to the virus, susceptible to political storms and winds. All right, before we study the Word tonight, we're going to take just a, 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 a block of time, about 20 minutes, and talk about, the, we're going to start a little series of the things we believe. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned, and that's part of where I was uh, trying to get to on Sunday. I'm just concerned that we're forgetting who we are or what we believe in the Assemblies of God and as Pentecostals. And I realized something today I've never realized before. So we'll talk about that. But let me um, start with a, an opportunity for you to speak or vent not long, but politically um, or culturally or, you know, uh, what do we call it in high school? World events. In about, in high school, ninth or 10th grade, I did a couple of papers. I had gotten really into the end times. We, um, when I was about 12, a new pastor came to the little non-Pentecostal church we had started attending, and he got us really into studying the Word of God. He also was somebody who believed that we were living in the end times, and he was uh, extremely enthusiastic about that teaching, and it got me enthusiastic. Now, I began to see things in the signs around me and in the world, and I was given the opportunity to write papers in high school, as most people are, right? And because this was converging at the same time, this excitement of mine and an opportunity to research and write, I was on to it. And so I did, one of the papers I did was about the one world government. And in studying the Illuminati and the coming world government, I studied families like the Bilderbergers and the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers. And um, man, I found out all kinds of things that other people didn't know. And I found all, and this was before, listen, before the internet. Yeah, I was like a research monster, man. We had a high school library, and I was there, and I found information. Uh, of course, it was limited to a place in the country that you couldn't find, even if you had GPS now. I grew up living on a dirt road or a gravel road. So this wasn't the, the Carnegie Library of History or the government, uh, what's the Library of Congress or anything like that. But nevertheless, I felt like I, I had found all kinds of stuff. And I had a class, I think it was called World Events, and um, you know what I learned after all that? You know what happened to all those people that I studied? They all died. You're exactly right, Brother Harold. They all died. <laughs> I also found out that nobody really cared uh, about all the stuff that I had unearthed. And um, I got a good grade on the paper. I don't remember if it was an A or B. But, um, and, and so I, I learned that... Um, I learned a lot of things, that the world really is a bad place, and there are a lot of bad operators out there. I also learned that uh, just shortly after that, I cannot remember when that was, but within a year, I entered Pentecost, and it changed everything for me. It changed my view of the world and end times. It changed my view of what I thought God was trying to do, and it also gave me a different focus. So uh, in this study, we're gonna, that's kind of where we're going to end up. What, what is it about us? We, you know, we have a church building like all churches. We have sound equipment and musicians like all churches, or most churches. And so we're going to talk about what makes us different. But it's been a rough few weeks um, politically for our country. Um, going all the way back, I would say, to just prior to the election, you could say it's, you know, it's always rough and tumble, and I would not disagree with you at all. 
but are there things that you feel um, challenged by or anything that you say, you know, I just, I just want to say this to the church tonight or I just want to get this off my chest. Uh, I have an opportunity on Sundays to, to talk and it's non-responsive or at least it's kind of the unspoken rule is it's non-responsive <laughs> while I'm preaching. But uh, is there anything that you've noticed or been one of the things you've been frustrated by? Or do you, do you have a sense of, of where the country's headed now or what we're going to do moving forward? Country's very, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. And tonight's not the first time we've all said that, right? It is, it's very fractured. And uh, the thing that's most concerning to me now is the, the, we, we feel like, many people feel like the options to repair that fracture are dwindling down to only one or two. And, you know, those are not good options. Okay. What I want to do is point your attention to what we focus on as Pentecostals. And one of the things that Sister Pam and I did on Sunday, and the Lord helped us to come to a place where we began to realize what it is. My, my thing, and what I was trying to bring Sunday is, I, I, don't, I don't feel that I've got experience or a voice to speak into politics. And sometimes I go places at, about church, American church and church leadership, and I need to kind of explain to you, I guess, that I do look at that on a national level. All right, I'm not focused just on our church. And I had been feeling, just being very agitated by some national leaders or people who had a voice, and I, I named... Sunday night when we did a little fireside or an online thing. You know, I named one, Brother Pat Robertson. I, I just was very disappointed that, again, uh, for not the first time, uh, spoke, thus saith the Lord, and um, then bailed out on it a week or two ago. He said, you know, the president's going to be reelected, and then sometime later there's going to be a meteorite that hits the world. And then just a week or two ago was saying, you know, the president needs to step aside and he's, um, uh, he's uh, un not unsteady. What was the word he used? Erratic. And I thought, okay, wait a minute, time out. If you said, thus saith the Lord, then you have to stick with that until either it comes to pass or you say, as Sister Pam said, others have said, I, I really felt, I gave God my everything, I prayed, I, I was surrendered, I don't have a dog in this fight, but I missed it, and I'm sorry. You, you have to stick with your, if you say, thus saith the Lord, and this troubles me. And so I shared that, and, and since then I've had two folks that said, you know, these are two people that I really value their walk with God and they're in our church. And they said, I'm so glad you said something about that because what he had said and what he did really upset me and I, I didn't know how to process that. That, that. I'm a pastor. You do that kind of stuff, you're hurting the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I got no problem with you prophesying. Matter of fact, we need 10,000 more. And that's what I wanted to say. Sunday morning, just like I said about evangelists back in the fall. But um, it, it just, um, uh, people doing that. Again, if you're into it, you either hang in with that word until it comes to pass or until you say, uh, you know, the Lord, I, I gave everything to the Lord, but I'm sorry. I, because I feel like some of them had a dog in the fight. And we don't belong there. Not maybe, I'm not talking about believers. I'm talking about church leaders. That's not my fight. And you can get sucked into that stuff as a church leader. And then it's, you just get into all of this you know, uh, prominence and position and, 
And I, what, I thought Billy Graham said one time, I would never step down from the calling of God to be in politics. Right? That's, that's my issue. All right? So, um, anyways, I, I want, where do I think we go? I think certainly as conservatives, as people who love God, hey, we're still called to the same thing. We need the next man or woman to step up. You know, and we got four years to regroup, to, to win more people over. First, my job to win them to Jesus Christ. But the political leader's job is to, to also influence them for the principles and policies that they believe reflect conservative or righteous values. Right? Just got to keep doing it. And um, let God put in whoever he wants. Amen? Yeah, we, I, listen, it's discouraging at times, but it's still the same battle. It's still the same thing. We've got to just keep on going, keep sharing for us as believers, all of us, sharing the love of God for people involved in uh, governmental leadership. I don't like to use the word politics when we could be talking about government leadership. That's a good position. That's a quality position to be in, right? And we need those people to be people who are fighting the good fight, and believing for the best. Okay, let's talk about what we believe. When things become unstable, it may be helpful to review what it, what it is that gives us stability. As believers, the truths that form our foundation are common to all of us. As those who believe that sharing our faith with others is necessary, we find ourselves in a spe specific camp or tribe within the Christian family. Right? You attend here, so you're not Methodist. You may have Methodist family members or friends, but you attend uh, not a Methodist church, and you're not in the, the Baptist camp. So what are we in? Um, anyone who is in the camp that, calls on, that believes the verse, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is a camp, a broad camp called evangelicalism. Most of you know that term. It's, it's not as positive now as it used to be. But that term simply means all of the organizations and, all, and the individuals who have that position. We believe in salvation by grace and instant work of salvation. We believe that people respond to the invitation of the Lord Jesus Christ and they receive their Salvation. We also believe, and evangelical is also somebody who believes that they should be active in sharing their faith. Hence the root for evangelist as well, right? So that's evangelical. It covers a lot of denominations and organizations. It's a broad umbrella. And this is sometimes why I think the, we, we, we get pulled in. And again, I'm talking about preachers. I'm talking about spiritual leaders that have a voice, not about anybody else. And I think we can get pulled into things because uh, we're rubbing shoulders with other evangelicals. You have to work together. I get that. But sometimes you can't. And you have to just kind of pull back. Within this tribe, and here's what I realized. We might not be in the tribe of evangelicals. It might be better for us to think of ourselves as right beside it. And that, for us, doctrinally, theologically, is the camp of the Pentecostals. And while we live, move, and exist, mostly as evangelical do, evangelicals do, yet we do not hold to every expression of our faith as they do. In this study, we're going to identify our similarities with those who are evangelical. More importantly, we're going to study our Pentecostal doctrine, allowing us to see differences. Now, this is going to be a different. We're not going to look at the 16 fundamentals of the Assemblies of God. We're not going to look at the four cardinal doctrines. Those 16 are kind of distilled down. And here's what they are. Jesus Christ, they're all about Jesus. Jesus is Savior, Healer baptizer in the Holy Spirit, and soon coming king. Amen, Sister Pam. Thank you. They took the 16, they took everything that we know, believe about the word of God, and that's it. That, it's Jesus. I could take it down to one. Jesus, right? 
When we start there, everything else eventually makes sense. Now, on the journey, no matter who you're in camp with, if you're in camp with the Baptists or the Seventh-day Adventists, you're in camp with the Catholics, you're, you're going to have bumps even with those in your own camp. Now, Sister Pam and I don't camp. We, we do hotels. And we do the beach. And we do both of those really well. And as we've gotten older, we've learned how to do them even better. <laughs> A little nicer, right? But uh, for those of you that camp, you know that you love bringing your RV in there or your tent and parking and everybody says hi to the one up on the hill and we have our own campfire. But I'm going to tell you something. Just because you're there roasting the same kind of hot dogs or marshmallows doesn't mean you agree with everybody in that campground. But you're having a good time, right? And that's the way it is in faith, in the Christian faith. And, and if the... If the enemy were to come and attack that campground, whoever the enemy is, you guys would all kind of, you know, huddle together and say, we're going we're gonna to make it. And that's the church. We, we understand our language. And so if, if the Catholics are saying, hey, this is what we say, we say, listen, that's just the Catholics, but we, this is how we see it. We don't necessarily throw them under the bus, right? What we're going to take a look at, though, is a way that our our doctrine is kind of experienced. So we're going to be talking about experiential doctrine over the next few weeks. Is that okay? Or experiential belief. And we're going to start right where the Bible starts. We're going to go to the very, the very first words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew chapter 3. Now, if you have the New Living Translation, it's possible that my words will be just slightly different than yours because I have an older rendering. I have the original New Living Translation. You might have version 2.0. And uh, I, I left my other one at the house. So this is um, 2.15, 3.15, I'm sorry, Matt. But Jesus said, it must be done because we must do everything that is right. So then John baptized him. And it's footnoted, and you, if you have a New King James or something else, this footnote will sound like yours. Or, we must fulfill all righteousness, right? We must fulfill all righteousness. So when we begin to talk about what we believe, we got to start at the beginning. And, and that is, what's our motivation? Why? Why do we believe anything? Um, Elon Musk believes certain things, and Jeff Bezos believes certain things. Um, the, the politicians believe certain things. The singers and movie TV stars believe certain things. And I don't know if any of them are important now. It's all the uh, Internet influencers. They believe certain things, right? What's our motive for believing? I don't know what theirs is. Oftentimes, as Sister Pam mentioned the other day, it's follow the money, right? It is to be in a position of uh, prosperity or perhaps power. But what's our motivation? Why do we want to know about faith? Why do we want to know about God? And so if we say, well, this is, this is our belief system, and we're trying to explain it to somebody, we've got to start where they are. And I believe the Bible's saying here, that it is in each of us to pursue righteousness. There's a desire. I, I, I guess I would say, and you can agree or disagree, or you can maybe put it into different words, but that we're wired with that passion to be right. To be right with somebody or something, to be right with God, to be righteous. Now, I'm not talking about being right in an argument or a discussion or right politically or anything like that. I'm talking about just being able to feel I'm okay. Now, the unbeliever, some of them will say, well, I don't need any religion because I'm a good person. And that is betraying. I believe that's exposing what I'm talking about, that there is within us a desire to know that we're okay or that we're good. And the other religions of the world, I'm not talking about the different Christian faiths. I'm talking about Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, things like that. And so all of them and people, philosophers who have no religion, people outside of religion will say, well, all religions are the same because they just help you to see or to know how to be good. 
again, it proves what I think is being demonstrated right here. This is what the Son of God wanted. I just want to make sure that as this thing starts, it starts with me pursuing righteousness. John said, well, time out. I, I can't baptize you. It's not possible. It doesn't work. Do you, do you see what he's saying? Now, yes, they have a, some sort of family relationship. I think the New Living calls them cousins, and we don't know, you know how close, but we do know that there's obviously communication. Mary and Elizabeth are uh, close enough that that's where Mary spent the early days of her pregnancy. But what we don't know is how long they've been separated. But when they come together professionally or in the calling, in the moment that God has brought them forth for, John is saying, no, no way. You don't understand. There's nobody on this planet that can baptize you. It, it doesn't, it's not possible. Jesus said, I understand. But what we're doing is declaring that it starts with righteousness. It starts with everybody understanding I'm right. I'm right with my Father. All right? That's the cry of our heart. That's what we want. That's what we're passionate about. And that's how we begin to seek after spiritual things. Every person, uh, so you want to fill in your, what do you perceive was his motivation for everything? To do the right thing or to fulfill the requirement of being righteous. You can write anything like that down, I would think, right? He wants to fulfill the requirement. So the Bible begins in the very start of the New Testament. We know it's a slightly different in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it begins by saying, more or less, you need to be right with God. I believe the Bible doesn't ask us our opinion or it doesn't go through all the steps or anything in the beginning because it understands that we know that instinctively. It may be buried, it might be deep, it might be hidden, but instinctively every soul knows that the soul needs to be right with God. Yeah, thank you. Every person is responsible to do what is right in life. The Bible on many occasions talks, especially in the Old Testament, about people, groups of people, societies getting to a point where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone doing what they felt or following their own desires and going away from God either individually or as a group. But every person is responsible to do what is right in life. Everyone, no exception. So how do we know what is right? Should humans realistically be able to find what is expected of them? I was reading an article the other day about um, somebody who uh, was a philosopher and, and was trying to find out what the meaning of life was. And he sent a survey to like 300 around the world, 300 leading thinkers and you know, super smart people. And all these answers he got, none of them had an answer. One of them even said, if you find out, please write back and tell me. And then they quote, I forget who it was, uh, Albert Einstein or somebody that without God, life is meaningless. The Lord's next words in Matthew 4.4 4 are just as insightful. Where do we get our authority? So if we're going to look for answers, where do we find the authority for those answers? Or if we're answering somebody, giving an answer for what we believe, what do we base our authority on? And you can see that right here in Matthew 4.4. 4. Jesus told him, these are the next words recorded in the Bible of the Lord. No, the scriptures say, people need more than bread for their life. They must feed on every word of God. So where can we find a detailed essay of the expectations that are upon us? Where? Where? Yeah, scriptures, God's word, right? Now, in this study, we're not going to take a look at how we know that this is God's word. We can do it uh, anytime, but we're not going to in this one, but it's self-evident. In other words, the Bible says this is the word of God. It's also proven experientially down through the generations, eons of time, or at least thousands of years, and it is doing both 
It's giving self-evidence to the testimony of many, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. If you're reading with us in the Old Testament right now, you're just into the life of Jacob and all those remarkable stories. So we could talk about God's Word and how it became accepted, which books were accepted and not. But what we know is this is the Bible. And that's where our authority comes from. Well, well what, if, what if the the Hindu points to the Hindu sacred writings, the Buddhist, and, and the Muslim points, well, is it self-evident? And they would say, well, yeah, it sure is. Okay. So do you have miracles? Do, does it produce changed life? Does it produce miracle? Does it produce resurrection? Does it have a Savior that lived for us, died for us, and rose for us? And the answer, of course, to all that is no. So you say, well, how do you know that that's not a made-up story? We come right back to Jesus. We have to believe in something. We believe in him because of what he did. Amen? All right, now go to Mark. Let's look at his first words in Mark. Did you ever think of this? You just look at the first words of Jesus in each of the Gospels. The Holy Spirit inspired the writers, Correct. And so you would assume that the first words of the Master, the Savior, the Messiah in each of the Gospels are pretty critical. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. At last the time has come, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Turn from your sins and believe this good news. First words of Mark allow us to see what our motivation is for pursuing the righteousness we are wired to crave. And the focus is on knowing what here? What should we know? What does that verse say that we should know? The kingdom of God is near. Right? The kingdom of God is near. And this is what I want you to Sister Pam and I want you to know, there are voices in evangelicalism and even, I guess you would say some, in the um, spirit-filled community that are not focused on the kingdom of God as a coming reality. They're focused on this world being improved so that the king can come. And that is a huge flashpoint in what's happening in the church world. I don't know about the government world and all of that. I, don't, I mean, I, I, you know, I read like you do. But, but in the church world, this is a big deal. And it's sending people in the wrong direction, in my opinion. And my opinion matters to you because I lead the church you attend. I speak into you. And so if the worldview, if the vision is we have to take over, Christians must take over business. They must take over industry. They've got to take over the arts and media. And Christians have to take over entertainment and sport. And Christians have to take over government so that all of this can be redeemed. It can't be redeemed until the church is in control. That's a popular theology among some. It's called Kingdom Now Theology. And then what you begin to do is you begin to influence everybody to work towards that goal. Jesus said, (laughs) you can forget that. The kingdom of God is what's coming. (laughs) I don't, oh, dear God in heaven, the last thing I want is for the Lord Jesus to bring me in and say, welcome, well well done, my good and faithful servant. Here's your house. And I'm living in the same house I'm living in now. That's not heaven. Now, I do believe there are some people who are living in a house in this world that they would say, I don't want to go to heaven. It can't near, be nearly as nice as this. Did you see the one that's going on sale? I don't even know where it's at. Three hundred and forty or fifty million dollars? The highest priced house I ever marketed? Three hundred. <laughs> what? I don't want. For the Lord to say, hey, great job, you're going to be a part of my kingdom, and, and you're going to be based right here at Central Assembly in this building. Like, this is great for now, but this is not. No, 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 this isn't it. Amen? 
All right, so we, we have to keep our focus clear. Jesus said, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near. I love that in these next, all three phrase, phrases here, Mark, and this is kind of the, the emphasis of Mark's gospel is the exclamation point. I mean, it's just everywhere. In his, uh, he probably ran out of ink 72 times because he's just, he loves the exclamation point. And I like a guy like that, don't you? And look at what he says, at last the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Turn from your sins and believe the good news. All right. Now go to Luke chapter 2. And um, if you have a question, you know you can get my attention or you can try to get my attention. And um, ask or make a comment. Well, this is somewhat of an oversimplification of Bible doctrine, okay? It's an, I'm, what I'm doing is an oversimplification. Studying the first recorded words of the Master in each gospel is incredibly revealing. By looking at the first, we catch some of his emphasis for us. Luke 2.49 gives us the motivation for being part of a local church family. So um, if you, uh, you're fill in the blank above that for Mark, I, I think is just knowing the kingdom of God is near. That's our motivation for pursuing the righteousness because the kingdom is so near, the invisible kingdom. But in Luke, uh, let's read it together there in 49. Now he's not 30 years old here. He hasn't even begun his public ministry. But Luke captures him saying, but why did you need to search, he asked. And we could add there his parents. You should have known that I would be in my father's house. Where do you find Jesus? Yeah, in his father's house, right? Yeah, you, you know, usually if I come out here and I'm asking you a question based on the verses, I'm just asking you what we just read, basically. Yeah, that's where we find Jesus. We find him in the house. And you can say, well, yeah, in other texts he was here and there and he was on the road and he was in, in other people's homes uh, healing people and teaching. I get it. But it starts. The gospel opens up. Matthew could have opened with, with Jesus speaking as a young person. But it's only Luke that captures this. And Jesus has not yet been baptized. But nevertheless, he is certainly Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And these are the first words the Holy Spirit has him speaking that are captured or recorded in the book of Luke. Why did you need to search? Now, even if they knew he was in the Father's house, they would have had to go back. So there is an element in which searching is the word like that you don't know where he is. But Jesus is not saying, don't look for me, don't pursue me. Right? He's saying, you know where I am, come and pursue me. We sing that song, In My Father's House. There's room for me, right? And the reason we meet in church is the reason we still have church buildings and sacred spaces is so that we can go there together and go after Jesus, that we can pursue him because we know where he is. Does that mean he's not in your house, not in your heart? Absolutely not at all. We know that. But whenever we talk about going after him in a way that demonstrates to him we are serious about this righteousness. We are serious about pursuing you and knowing you. Well, we're going to have to spend at least some of our time in the house. Amen? Praise God. So that's why I, I, I know people say, well, the church should be back in, the, in homes, and we're just doing home groups, and we're just doing small groups, and we're just doing all this. Um, yeah, that's fine, and there's a place for all that, but there's always a place for the Father's house. It doesn't have to be either or. It can be and both. So you can have the Father's house and home groups or cell groups or home studies or whatever you want to call it. You can have fellowships and meet here and meet there, and you should. We should. But there's always a place for the Father's house because Jesus is there. He'll always be there. Amen. Okay. We're running out of time, and I, want, I do want to give you a chance to uh, ask questions. John. You know where we're headed now, right? John chapter 1. And there we find in verse 38. Uh, you're filling the blank there. What I put for mine is he, Jesus the Messiah, can only be found in his father's house. Now, 
you can meet him anywhere. I, I don't pray in here every day, right? But he, he never leaves the Father's house. Maybe that's the best way to say it. He never leaves the Father's house. He can also be a lot of other places, but he's never not in his Father's house. John chapter 1 and verse 38. Jesus looked around and saw them following, meaning a couple of John's, uh, John the Baptist's disciples, and saw them following. What do you want, he asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? I think this one is perhaps the most revealing of all. He says to the ones who begin to follow him, they're, they're, they're still in that kind of introductory mode, and he says, what do you want? What do you want? What's the King James? What seeketh thou? New King James? What do you seek? Yeah, I think the King James is, I didn't look it up, but I think it's what seekest thou. Uh Uh-huh, praise God. What do you want? And this is really, again, we're going back to kind of base. So all believers, everybody that loves Jesus, all of this is, it pertains to all of us. It's common to all of us. It's got all of us. And what that is, is the foundation. This is, this is the, the, the foundation. So we could call these, um, I'm calling them the four corners. Uh, discovering what we believe. Number one, one corner is righteousness. Because every Every human being should want righteousness, right living, or being right with God. You can, you can word it however you want. But there is a cry. If it's not in every human being, you tell me how somebody strung out on drugs, living in all kinds of immorality, killing people and in jail, how they get saved. They get saved just like everybody else does because every person, not just the better ones, not just the enlightened ones, but every person has a desire in their soul to know that they are right, to live right, to live righteous, to be right with God. Number two, the other corner, the nearness of the kingdom of God. And the flip side of that coin is that the eternal kingdom is coming. The no, let, let's not use that word. The non-perishable kingdom. Amen? Because this kingdom, this world is perishing. It's another King James word. But it's a good one. It is fading away. It's falling. It's going gonna, it's gonna to melt in a fervent heat, Peter said. It's, they, they couldn't find enough words to describe what's going to happen to this world, could they? It's going to disappear. Roll up like a scroll, Isaiah said. And pass away. And what we know is there's a glorious, undefiled, imperishable kingdom that is coming. And that's near, Jesus said. Number three, there, the corner, one corner of our building is that we need to belong to a faith family. We need to belong. And number four, I put, for me, a corner is seeking Jesus. Seeking Jesus because he has revealed himself to be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Now, does everybody know that? That's not part of our discussion. Whether or not everybody knows it has absolutely no bearing on whether he is or not. Or whether he has revealed that. Okay, These corners are common to all believers, or at least they should be. It's as we build upwards that we see the great differences between evangelicals and Pentecostals. And that's where we're going to go in the future. And I've got a little bit of a hint there for you. We'll talk about um, the what of life. So manifestations in ministry and the how, methods and mannerisms, how we live, how we talk, okay? Who has a, uh, a comment or input question?